This afternoon, thunderstorms dotting the southeastern U.S. and a chance of severe weather in Illinois. Let's take a quick look at those climate indexes. The North Atlantic Oscillation is in negative territory, indicating a slightly slow and locked up flow. Most of the other indicators are neutral. Of course, we are heading into El Nino. And the Madden Julian Oscillation is in phase three, a very weak MJO signal. There's the surface map as we head into the evening hours. We have an active frontal system across the Midwest. A frontal wave located in northern Illinois that's responsible for the enhanced risk that we have out in that area. We'll cover that shortly. A cold front trailing out to northern Kansas near the Interstate 70 corridor. A triple point just northwest of Hill City. And a dry line extending along the Caprock down into the Big Bend of Texas. And some very warm temperatures in that region up to 108 at Lubbock. We did see 110 earlier at Midland, breaking the record for the date, and mid-100s around DFW. A check of the data as we record this, 109 at Mineral Wells, 107 at Wichita Falls, 104 at DFW, and Midland has cooled off to 107. In the southeastern U.S., heat and humidity, although the heat is really not all that bad, Dew points are up in the mid-70s, helping to fuel these areas of storms in Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi. Another area of storms across the northeastern U.S. Out ahead of this cold front, they do have some very warm weather. Around the New York City area, it has cooled off, but we had a very hot afternoon. It was 95 at Newark. And we saw 91 degrees at Central Park, 93 at LaGuardia. But up to the north, storms and showers and much cooler temperatures. Only in the 70s, out around Albany and Springfield. There's a look at that area on AWIPS, which is the same system used by the National Weather Service. Strongest storms moving into Massachusetts there, just south of Albany, around Hudson. And another complex of storms in northern Pennsylvania. However, all eyes focused on the Chicago area. Tornado warnings in effect. Let's zoom in on that region using a whips. And there it is. The air mass feeding these storms coming out of the south-southwest. Dew points in the mid to upper 60s and temperatures in the mid 80s. So this is all the source region for the fuel going into this thunderstorm complex up to the north. Let's take a look at GR2 Analyst. And there's what the situation looked like from 6.20 to 6.30 p.m. A couple of discrete supercells moving across the Chicago area, a strong one up to the north. Social media, of course, covering that. The Chicago hashtag showing that storm moving across Chicago. And as we record this, 6.43 p.m., most of the cells have moved out into Lake Michigan, one other weaker cell moving across the south side of the city, but out to the west, other cells up to the northwest near the airport. And of course, those will bear watching. And all of that activity associated with this enhanced risk centered on Chicago, out to Rockford, and another enhanced risk across western Missouri. A quick look at the satellite imagery across northern Missouri shows a storm complex northwest of St. Louis, moving southeast, and probably heading into the city. The western part of the state, though, not much going on. So, not too sure we're going to see that enhanced risk realized. Although the high-resolution rapid refresh does show right around sunset, storms do get going. And quite a few of them. So it looks like things are not over for that area. It's going to be a late show. And things will be picking up through the evening. So yeah, I guess we're looking at an MCS for the Ozarks later tonight. And into the northern Arkansas region around daybreak. Heading out west. Lots of hot weather. 110 degrees at Phoenix. 105 at Las Vegas. And 103 at El Paso. Today, El Paso recorded its 27th consecutive day of 100-degree temperatures, and that's the longest streak since 1887. 
and even back on June 26th, they did peak at 110. In the northwestern U.S., an excessive heat watch is in effect for the Great Basin area, temperatures into the mid-90s in some areas. Excessive heat warnings through the rest of the state, down through Las Vegas and Tonopah and up to Reno. Excessive heat warning all through the San Joaquin Valley, and that's really going to take effect as we go into the weekend. I'll show you that shortly. In western Canada, we're seeing lots of wildfire smoke once again. We have heavy fires going on in central British Columbia and many, many smoke plumes from the Northwest Territories down through Alberta. Some storms in around the Edmonton area and through the Canadian Rockies. Heading up to Alaska, it is mild temperatures in the 50s and 60s, and we've seen a drop in temperatures. Back on Monday, we had 85, 86 degrees throughout Yukon, and we're down into the 70s this afternoon. However, the Northwest Territories is not done with the heat. Heat warnings all up and down the Mackenzie River Plain for temperatures 27 to 32 Celsius, 81 to 90 Fahrenheit, through the rest of the week, all the way through Saturday. In the Canadian Arctic, looks pretty typical. Temperatures in the 30s and 40s, about where we want to see them this time of year. And we've got a little occlusion spinning around in the western Hudson Bay region and an occlusion moving through Quebec into Newfoundland. Temperatures are definitely lower than what we've seen over the past week. Let's take a look at the upper levels. This is what forecasters are really interested in. This is the jet stream level, and we see a polar front jet across the northern plains the strongest winds over South Dakota up to 110 knots there and other segments of the polar front jet all the way up to Labrador and flowing right around this ridge in the Labrador Sea. This is a high amplitude pattern and it is somewhat blocky. This is kind of unusual for summertime and going into the weekend, an active Hudson Bay vortex still moving around in eastern Canada a blocking pattern out there in the Gulf of Alaska. This is a Rex block deep below beneath this ridge. Not really a classic Rex block, but it is a block nevertheless. And you can see it trying to reestablish itself going into early next week. Further south, the polar front jet remaining in the northern tier states, affecting the Midwest region. So maybe a couple of additional rounds of severe weather over the next week. And then going into the tail end of next week, high amplitude pattern once again. Strong ridge building across Alberta and a deep trough off of the west coast. And we're not quite done with the upper levels. The 500 millibar chart is a good barometer of the potential for heat. This is kind of a thickness chart in a way, not literally a thickness chart, but the heights that we see at 500 millibars, that's a re reflection of the amount of heat that we have in the atmosphere. And when we start seeing these 594, 597 decameter contours, and rarely 600, that means we're really laying on the heat across the southern states. Now, there has been some talk of a death ridge for next week, not really seeing that on the charts. The ECMWF did have that on Wednesday, but I do advise caution because these charts are not all that accurate when we get out beyond five or six days. They do flip-flop a little bit, and we have seen that. The ECMWF has backed off on that scenario of 600 decameter heights through this area, but I will tell you that the temperatures that it showed were not really that high. They were very similar to what we had today. So some of that you're seeing on social media is hype, but it does, of course, bear watching. So we're up to Sunday. A very firm 597 decameter contour across the southwest, 600 over Las Vegas, which is pretty rare. And this is going to be the hottest day of this particular episode. And this is what we're talking about. I can't really fit all this on the screen, but there it is. This is the forecast for Sunday from the National Digital Forecast Database. And take a look at California and especially Death Valley. See that right there? That's the highest reading on the chart. 
Death Valley 130, which would tie the modern all-time high for Death Valley and the modern all-time high for the U.S. I believe that was also tied at Palm Springs a couple years ago. They also hit 130. And on this day, 120, we're seeing 110 in some parts of the San Joaquin Valley, 103 at Tonopah, which is one degree short of their all-time record, and some very hot scorcher temperatures from Las Vegas to Phoenix. And then heading through the rest of the period into Monday and Tuesday, some reduction of those heights, but it will remain hot through the southwestern U.S., a little bit of ridge building eastward, so possibly a continuation of hot weather into Texas for the middle of July. And now for a place that does not get heat. This is the time of year when Antarctica sees its absolute lowest temperatures, basically from July 10th to July 25th. They are in the thick of winter. The coldest temperature ever observed on Earth was at Vostok, Antarctica. Back in 1983, July 21st, they got down to minus 129 Fahrenheit. Some satellite measurements published in geophysical research letters have suggested that on the ice sheet, some remote areas may have dropped to minus 144 at times. The surface there is insulated by an ice sheet up to two miles thick, and there's no source of heat except for what comes in from space and from the coastal areas. What we had five hours ago looked like this, a rather balmy 94 degrees at Vostok, the South Pole at minus 89, and McMurdo Sound around minus 19. And those are some of the key stations there. The main scientific effort in Antarctica is at McMurdo Sound. A lot of the flights go into that region, and then they service the South Pole from there. I don't know how Vostok is serviced. I think the Russians have a base, and they drive supplies overland. And there's probably a couple ferry flights working through that area. And the other bases are smaller, but I know that somewhere around here, maybe maybe around that region, Australia has its own base, and they've actually got jet airliner flights from the Australian mainland. Anyway, enough of Antarctica. Let's take a look at the tropics. This is when we start getting very wary of hurricanes. We are heading into the beginning of major hurricane season. Nothing going on right now. We've got one little storm. I think it's Invest 94L, I believe. That's way off the northeastern point of Bermuda, and that's moving away. So we're not concerned about that. Over the next seven days, things are looking pretty quiet. However, we do have Calvin well off the coast of Mexico, up to 65 miles an hour, 1,000 millibars on that, moving westward. And this is of some interest because it may be positioned to affect Hawaii. This is the next seven days. You can see it moving westward and then starting to weaken around Sunday or Monday as it hits the cooler waters. And then sometime around Wednesday or Thursday, what's left of the circulation and quite a bit of moisture with it will hit Hawaii. So we're not expecting a whole lot out of that, but conditions could be kind of anomalous. Maybe some unusual weather up on the mountains, maybe some heavy rains along the windward coast areas. And here's how things are looking out in the Atlantic. I figure I'll give you the precipitable water. And what we see is, yeah, a couple waves moving eastward, a lot of stable waves. I don't really see any closed circulations. The main convergent area right through here, this is kind of painting out a deformation zone where we have divergent flow north and south and convergent flow east and west. However, none of it really wraps up into a closed low and going through the end of next week. Just typical northeasterly trade winds through the Caribbean and southern portions of the North Atlantic. Well, we are really burning through the time here. It's already 7.24 p.m. I need to get this wrapped up. But there's the situation in St. Louis. Looks like a almost a solid line of convection. The strongest right there, tail end Charlie. 
And let's head up to Chicago to see what's going on. We have a tornado warning in effect once again. That's from the Southern Complex moving east-southeast. And along that, yeah, a little cell right there. Let's zoom in on that. Seems to be hitting that same area around Berwyn and has that triangular supercell appearance. I don't know if it's just me, but the resolution from this radar looks a little bit coarse. Not really sure what's going on there. This looks like pre-2008 radar data. But uh, yeah, this is 0 0.5, so it may be the VCP that they're in. I'm not sure. But the storm relative velocity does show cyclonic shear along that boundary, although it's not really concentrated into a very tight center. There is one little center way up here. And with the most recent frame, looks like that's washed out a little bit, and we've got more of a linear structure moving through the Chicago area. Anyway, that's all I got for this evening. Let me get this rendered and uploaded. Hope you have a good evening, and we'll see you back here on Friday for another edition of Forecast Lab. Take care. Bye-bye.